Catherine Clauber will be speaking with us, or to us. Uh, she's received academic recognition both for her teaching of art history and for her work as a studio artist. Her artwork has been widely exhibited and her narrative portraits may be found in public and private collections throughout the United States. As a speaker and arts educator, Ms. Clauber has presented lectures in art history at several venues, including Houston Museum of Natural Science, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the McNay Art uh, Museum in San Antonio. She holds a Master of uh, Education degree in Art Education from the University of Houston with a specialization in the Art Museum. Ms. Clauber has presented numerous courses in art history and studio art for the Glasscock School of Continuing Studies. Please help me welcome Catherine Clauber. Thanks. Thank you. All right, our last sound check. Are we doing okay? All right, great. Uh, a couple of things I want to say about this uh, wonderful series is I'm going to get lunch, and uh, I hope you'll join us afterwards over at the Brockstein Pavilion. Uh, I'll be there until 12.30, and I'd love to see you all and talk more about Vincent, uh, a gentleman who is forever enthralling. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about things, hopefully some things that, that you're not particularly aware of. We all think that we know Van Gogh. We've all been exposed to Van Gogh in song and Van Gogh in uh, life. We all have members of our families who have a bit of Van Gogh about them. I know I do. I may be one of them. <laughs> but if you'll uh, indulge me and take a look at your agenda for just a moment before we get started, I'd like to point out a couple of interesting things. One is down below on the, uh, on the front of your page. Uh, you'll see five distinctive artistic periods. I think that's going to come in very helpful uh, this morning. One thing I'd like to point out, though, just to, to get right down to the crux of it, is that Vincent, his early work was, uh, was done over essentially a five-year period. And then there was the move to Paris, which lasted effectively two, on to Arles for a bit more than one year, Saint-Rémy, one year, and then his last stop at Auvers, two months. As time went on, Van Gogh was becoming ever more prolific. And we'll talk about that as we move through our topic today. But if you'll flip that page over for just a moment, for those of you who have a particular interest in this subject, I'd like to point out a couple of wonderful sources. Going down the list, there is one you'll see by Victoria Finley. It's called Color, A Natural History of the Palette. For those of you who are interested in color and color theory and the, the exploration of pigments and where they are found naturally occurring on the planet, that is a wonderful, wonderful source. Do you need me? It's just the T's that do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Is that sound is still good? All right, as you go down a bit further, there is a source, a book by Andrew Hussey that is called Paris, The Secret History. That is a wonderful read, and I would highly recommend it. It isn't uh, quite what it sounds. One might think that, well, we're discussing brothels and the like. Well, yes, that does come up, and there was quite a bit of that in Paris throughout history. But this is, again, it's a truly wonderful read about things that we're not normally exposed to about the history of Paris, which certainly dovetails in the life of Vincent van Gogh. Down towards the bottom is the wonderful 900-page tome on uh, Van Gogh, The Life by Stephen Nafith and Gregory White Smith. This is the book that just came out, I think about eight or 10 months ago. And it is incredibly detailed, but is a galvanizing read. Usually one gets one's hands on a 900 page book and you have moments of drifting in and out. And this truly held my interest throughout better even than picking up McMurtry's uh, Lonesome Dove, I assure you. The last one on the list that I want to mention is by Sue Rowe, and that is The Private Lives of the Impressionists. Again, a wonderful and engaging read. 
So these, and if anybody has any questions about these, please ask me when we meet over at the Brockstein Pavilion. I'll be happy to discuss them with you. But these are reads that I would strongly suggest to any and all who have interest in these various areas. Down at the very bottom, you'll see Vincent Van Gogh's letters. They can be found online. This is actually through the Van Gogh Museum. We'll talk a bit about that towards the end of our lecture today. And they are wonderfully organized, put together extremely well. You can find a, a letter that you wish to read by topic or even by keyword. So another wonderful, wonderful source. I did want to mention those items before we got going. All right. Vincent Van Gogh. Well, let's talk for just a moment about the personality of the man. Yes, he was difficult. He was extremely sensitive. He was argumentative. But he was spiritual as well. And importantly, he was one of the most self-documenting artists of all time. And that includes the present day. We can find Vincent's views on just about every topic imaginable. Some we may not prefer to read about, others we do, but they're all there. Uh, his principal correspondent was his brother Teo. We'll talk a bit about Teo as we move on. But let's just talk for a moment about his style before we, we really get rolling with this lecture. He painted, as many of you know, over essentially just a 10-year period. These were passionate works. We'll talk about what that means in a bit. He was, uh, he's been labeled essentially the father of expressionism, and we'll talk about why. And he was extremely prolific. Over 2,000 works of art, over 1,100 drawings, over 900 paintings. But only two-thirds of these works can be found today. How do we know that they exist? because Vincent told us they did. Some of them might have been destroyed. Some of them might have been lost in the war. We've all heard stories. But I believe, personally, that quite a few of those are yet to be found. Van Gogh at 18. I'd like to say a word about the camera. The camera was introduced in the late 1820s. Uh, Louis Daguerre gets credit for doing that, but he did have help. And in England, uh, this was, uh, Daguerre of course was a Frenchman, and in England the camera was introduced by a gentleman by the name of Talbot. The difference between the two was that Daguerre was paid an annuity for his copyright to the French government, and thus the people of France were privy to the tools of the, of the new camera, or quote unquote camera, the daguerreotype. In England, however, Talbot held on to his copyright, and thus the tools, the materials, were too expensive because he set the price for uh, the majority of the population to get their hands on a camera. And so you had the development of modern photography principally in France. Something to hold on to as we move along, and obviously here is just a little bit of the proof of that. Now, many of you might recognize Monet's Rouen Cathedral from his great series of 25. These were all painted between 1892 and 1894. Pretty late in the game if you're thinking in terms of Impressionism. But he was the quintessential Impressionist, Claude Monet. Now what did the Impressionists do? They took what the camera had changed that need, that burning need, to represent figures realistically. And they turned it into something new. They took fleeting moments in time. They rid their palettes of black. They took what the sunlight could do, and they transposed that onto canvas with paint. But the Impressionists also had a collective way of seeing. They all belonged essentially, if you will, to a club, a fraternity, a family. And in this way, they met together at the Café Gerbois, they took vacations together, they fought together, they married. You name it, it happened with the Impressionists. But my point is, it was a collective. 
The first impression is show, 1874. The last 12 years later, 1886. There were eight of them in total. And Vincent van Gogh was not too terribly impressed with any of it. If we think in terms of the avant-garde during those years, these were individuals who were interested in taking what the Impressionists had introduced and pushing it further. And I would say, I would declare that four principal members of that avant-garde would have been Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne, and Seurat. And they'll come up intermittently in this lecture today. But what were they looking for? They were looking for a new way yet of doing things. They were looking for new theories. They were interested in the analytical side of painting. They didn't want to simply look at a scene and transpose that, take what light could do, and use light and bright colors in truly a magnificent way, but put that to canvas. They wanted more. They wanted more thoughtful, if you will, art. So they were looking for formulas, but they were also looking for individual personal expression. The group that came to be known as the post-impressionists were those four that I've just mentioned. And by the way, that term wasn't coined until 1910 by an English critic by the name of Roger Fry, declaring that what post-impressionist essentially was, was personal expression weighted with formula. And this is, so therefore, a, an individual expression of a formula for a new way to create art. Let's see what happened with this. Here is our Vincent at the age of 13. He was, you may not be surprised, a difficult child. He was born in 1853, just one year after uh, uh, Louis uh, Napoleon uh, transposed uh, so much about uh, Paris in particular and France in general and gave us the Hausmanization, which is what in fact it's come to be called, of Paris. What does that mean? He, they moved into the old Paris. Thousands and thousands of people uh, were relegated to the streets when this happened and they literally raised block after block of old Paris, the warrens of that old medieval city. And it became what we know, what we recognize. To us as Americans, it seems rather historic. But to the people of France, Paris is a very modern city. That change happened principally between 1853 and 1870. And it made one of Vincent's adult habitats quite interesting for him on many different levels. And we'll talk about this further as we move along. Back to Vincent as a young man. His family had two strong suits. One of them was the study of religion, and one of them was the marketing of art. And it seemed that especially the gentlemen in the family went truly one way or another. There weren't other vocations that were even discussed. Vincent's father was a Protestant minister in the Dutch Borinage. By the way, the Borinage is, for those of you who don't know, is near the border of Belgium and France. And it's a little bit further than midway between Paris and Amsterdam, a bit closer to Amsterdam. But we're talking hundreds of miles. And Den Haag, The Hague, is somewhere just to the north in between. So those are our, our basic reference points. Vincent spent a solitary childhood he had collections. We all know kids who have collections, and maybe we were those kids. Vincent would collect birds' eggs in massive collections that he kept Now, his room was not. He was rather a mess. But those collections were pristine, and they would be shells that he found, rocks that he located, all manner of things. He was obsessed, I think it's fair to say, with his collections. He was the oldest of six children, and he was admittedly the most difficult. But as almost an afterthought, I'd like to mention that all of the six Van Gogh children have di had difficulties. Uh, two uh, ended their days in asylums. 
One committed suicide, one is doubtful, one died of syphilis, and we are nearly at six already. Vincent's father was stern, he was didactic, and life was tough with dad. Uh, Vincent's mother was, uh, if not artistic, certainly introspective. And she was highly passionate, she was very sensitive herself, and she was very disturbed that her oldest child was giving them so much trouble. What was he doing? Well, for one thing, he hated school. Vincent's mother uh, had come from a family who weighted uh, education heavily. And when her oldest child, one who perhaps might set a pattern for the rest, hated school so vehemently, this was truly a problem. He would walk home from school at midday, day after day after day. Finally, they put him in a boarding school. He was there for about six months, and around about his 15th birthday, he got on the road and walked home. I believe it was 20 or 30 miles. Came home, went up to his attic bedroom, perhaps came out for his meals, but effectively was in that attic for the next six months until the family decided we have got to do something with this kid. What is it going to be? We're going to send him to his uncle Sint, and we're going to see if he can make it selling art in Sint's gallery. Let's talk about the Vincents and the Teos in this family. It was a family not only who had these two strong suits in vocations, but the family had two principal names that it doled out generation after generation to the men of the family. One was Vincent, and one was Teo. Now, Vincent, for instance, had two grandfathers, all in the world he, he possessed, that were both named Vincent. Uh, he had an uncle named Vincent, and rather importantly, the oldest child had actually died at birth, and that child had died exactly one year before the birth of Vincent, and that child had been named Vincent. Uh, as for the Teos, Vincent's father was a Teo, he was called Doris, and his brother, younger by four years, Teo, the one that we know so much about, won, of course. Now, through the years, Teo, Vincent's brother, again, younger by four years, would be his principal correspondent. And these two would write well over 700 letters, one to the other, alone. Vincent was a formidable correspondent, and he didn't just correspond with his brother Teo as the years went by, he corresponded with everyone. And more often than not, he did not receive replies. Vincent was, after all, an argumentative guy. I'd like to read something for you about this uh, extended family uh, that, that really brings home the fact that these this group of people, this extended family, was doing all that they could for this child. Uh, this letter actually, the first one I want to quote from, actually comes from very close to the end of Vincent's life, and it was a letter from his sister-in-law, Jo, who will come up uh, again later in the lecture. But Jo had married Teo. This gave Vincent a tremendous amount of grief. And in May of 1890, he would die in July of that year, this is what she wrote to him, and she had only met him twice. What surprises me, Vincent, is that such a tiny baby, she's talking about her new son named Vincent, already has his own personality, in the face of which you're utterly powerless. He can sometimes look at me as if he wants to say, what are you actually doing to me? I know more about things than you do. They're the eyes of a grown-up, Vincent. And then, with a great deal of expression, could he have maybe the makings of a philosopher? This is the way she's talking to a brother-in-law that she hardly knows. And these are the final lines in a letter from Teo, who did not have an idea that this would be the last letter that his brother would ever receive from him. Let's hope, Vincent, that the health of all of us may improve, for health is a great deal. Enclosed, I'm sending you 50 francs. Write to me quickly, and believe me, your brother who loves you. This gives us a good idea about the strength of these family ties. 
and Vincent put them through a lot. This is a portrait that Vincent created when he was 27 of his grandfather, Vincent. The year was 1881. Who was he looking at? He was looking at the works of Daumier, the great caricaturist and political satirist. Vincent was always interested in art, but again, he only declared it his principal vocation in the last 10 years of his life. But what was happening earlier? Well, we know about him walking home from school. We know that the family was desperate to find him a job, and they sent him to Den Haag to work for his uncle Sint. That lasted about a year. It is, it's assumed, there's not a lot of documentation about what exactly happened when Vincent went to work for Uncle Sint, but it is assumed that the arguments that happened time and time again undoubtedly transpired. Vincent was then sent to their London office where he worked for just over a year and he was fired from the London office. Vincent then decided he would become a teacher he found a job at a boys' school outside of London. He worked there for a very short time, got fired, decided that he was going to study for, uh, the, uh, to become a minister, and uh, went back to the University of Amsterdam and could not find a post. No one would accept him. Now, there are reasons for this, and we'll get into this a bit later, but as I said, he was difficult. Vincent was constantly trying to, he's the kind of person that would try to nail you, if you will, in a conversation. When you go to a party and someone's got their finger in your face and someone is saying, this is what I have to say and this is how I mean it, and if you don't agree, I'm gonna try it again. I'll try it from the left, I'll try it from the right, but by God, I want you to understand what I'm saying. This is the kind of personality that Vincent had and it truly rubbed people the wrong way. There he is again, we saw this initially, at about the time of, excuse me, actually this one is 10 years later, but we've got one later that'll show you Vincent at about that age. Now, on the left you have his brother Teo as an adult, and on the right is Teo's wife Jo and their baby Vincent. We'll hear more about Teo. And this I find fascinating. This is one of many, many illustrated letters that Vincent wrote. And what he had to say in this particular letter that we're looking at right here, uh, which was sent to Teo in May of 1889, was this. Perhaps someday I'll be in a position to repay all that I've spent, because I consider that what I've spent is, if not taken from you, at least taken from the family. So consequently, I've produced paintings, and I'll do more. Now, what was happening? The family had been paying an allowance, if you will. Even when Vincent was working for his uncle in Den Haag and London, the, Vincent's father, who didn't have much money, was paying to keep Vincent afloat. Finally, Teo, who was doing well himself, working for the same uncle in a different gallery setting, decided uh, I'll take over this responsibility. And so from that moment on, Teo, and this was about 1880, Vincent took over, if you will, effectively, the responsibility of Vincent and all of Vincent's finances. And through the years, this would mean virtually everything. This was food, this was rent, painting materials, clothing, everything. Vincent was acutely aware of it, and he was acutely aware of disappointing his family. This is a piece that Vincent did while looking at the works of the great realists, in particular here, copying a Millet. This was 1880, and he was strongly influenced by the realists, and he would go to the museums constantly. He was always on the road, and if he couldn't get a train, if he couldn't afford it, he would walk. And when the Rijksmuseum opened in 1885, one of the first individuals through those doors was Vincent van Gogh. 
By the way, just a word about pronunciation. The correct pronunciation of his last name would be Van Hoch. Well, that comes to me just, to, it's a little bit difficult, so forgive me if we call him Van Gogh. But you can see easily where Van Hoch becomes Van Ho and becomes Van Gogh. So we have certainly uh, anglicized, if you will, that name. But here is the original Millet. Now this is called the Angelus and it was painted back in 1859. We can see that it's rather colorful, particularly when we compare it to the work we just viewed of Vincent's. And let's go back for just a moment. So Vincent is clearly not interested in color here, but he is interested in, if you will, nailing a narrative. He's interested not in the nuances of value of the lights and darks, but it's not an unfaithful representation. So here is Millet's again, and there is Vincent's. That is actually on nothing more than a folded sheet of paper. Vincent often was broke, would outspend his allocated funds from his dad and then from Teo, and he would draw, he would write, he would compose a letter on virtually anything that he found. Now here comes a quote that I find very interesting. Vincent was already having episodes of what we believe to be epilepsy. So that he was having seizures. They not only frightened him, but they certainly uh, affected the people surrounding him. And this was at a time when it was assumed that you had you know, witch-like qualities if you, were, if you were falling to the floor and your body was shaking uncontrollably. So this made his life even tougher. So with that in mind, after Vincent discovered painting, this is what he had to say in one of his letters to Teo. I can very well do without God, but I cannot, ill as I am, do without something which is greater than I, which is my life, which is the power to create. Vincent also fell deeply in love with his cousin Key. And what's in interesting about all this is that this was one of many times that Vincent would declare an obsession. In his letters about Key, he would not write so much about the way you might anticipate a young man in love might, but he would write about the forceful issue of convincing her that he was right for her. These were the kinds of letters quote unquote, love letters that Vincent would write. And many members of that extended family would get their hands on those letters and just roll their eyes. It's, he thinks he's in love, but this is about possession. This is about changing someone's mind. This is about the power behind that. Uh, this went on, by the way, for quite some time. Key was not interested, and as a matter of fact, I believe the quote went, not just no, Vincent, but absolutely no. So Key was truly not interested in this. Vincent would traipse down to her family's home, miles and miles away, knock on the door. She'd flee to a back closet or out the back door altogether. Vincent would sit there for hours waiting for her. Her parents would beg him to leave. This went on time after time after time until finally the family was simply worn out and told him not ever to return. Here is one of many of Vincent's early sketches. This particular one is, uh, is called Still Life with Honesty. And you'll notice the pipe there and the accoutrements of daily life. And we'll see Vincent developing more and more of an interest in these types of things. The strokes, the pin strokes are hatched and cross-hatched, and there's a bit of floating color, watercolor. But there's still not much we can clearly see of an interest in color for its own sake. Vincent was depressed. He couldn't convince his cousin to marry him. He found a prostitute, and by the way, the reason for finding the prostitute was because uh, Vincent couldn't pay most models what they were demanding to pose for him. 
And so as he became more and more, ever more the, the artist, he was looking harder and harder for models and could only afford prostitutes. A prostitute did move in with him. She was pregnant at the time. She had the baby while they were together. And he convinced himself in another obsession that he was going to marry her and he was going to make things right for her. Well, his family, if you recall, is paying the allowance for him. And the family was saying, oh, no, you don't. You're not going to do this to us. This is too much. And finally, when Vincent, he fought and fought and fought for that. But when he finally realized they were going to cut him off, he packed up his things and he left uh, the prostitute and he moved on. He was severely depressed and he was trying to build a family where one didn't exist. He was trying his family to the very ends of their patience. He was picking, if you will, the wrong people. He was struggling through these moments of obsession. Things weren't working out. One of the things that Vincent did do during these years, this particular piece was painted in 1885. So this is fully five years. This is the end of that very first uh, uh, period of, of art, art in Vincent's life. He painted this as an homage to his father. It's called Still Life with Open Bible, Extinguished Candle and novel. And what we can't really tell here is that it is fluid with pigment, with paint. It's thick. Imagine it a wet surface, and if we were to take a palette knife and scrape it off, lots and lots of paint. Well, there's an issue with that. It just isn't just as simple as, as one uh, expressing themselves through paint. But paint cost a small fortune. These pigments, by and large, were natural, many of them mineral-based, and they were hard to come by. As many of us may know, for years it was very difficult, and, and would be now, certainly, to get uh, lapis, to mine for lapis. Why? Because lapis comes from Afghanistan. On my way here this morning, I turned on the news, and Afghanistan is again in the news. So you can see clearly where at different points historically, that it's very difficult to get one's hands on a quality pigment because these literally come from around the world. And lapis, by the way, for many points historically, cost more than gold because it was harder to come by. So here is Vincent, and he's using yellow. He's using these, these colors in a, in a very, if you will, uh, expressionistic way, and it simply wasn't done. The Romantics had done it a bit, and he was profoundly influenced by them, Romantics such as Delacroix and Jericho, and he would go to the museums and he would look at their works. But no one had really gotten away with this in the modern world. Here is another one that Vincent, another piece that Vincent uh, painted during these years. This was 1885-86. It's simply called Pair of Shoes. And he was interested when he moved to the Dutch Borinage and he decided that he was going to do missionary work as his last stop before becoming a painter. He started painting the things that mattered, he thought, the things of daily life. And this is one of those. Now, again, he's using a lot of natural colors. The canvas was full of paint. And excuse me, I believe this one is painted on board. We see a signature in the upper left. The shoes just as someone would have left them, a hard-working soul. And that's what his statement was for him. He wrote about it. These were harsh stories, he would say, for harsh lives. Here is another piece that Vincent created during this time. We have to give him credit for having a sense of humor. He took a short course, and I call it a short course because he got tossed out of that one, too. Uh, and uh, they were using the model. Vincent was probably getting too much feedback about how he couldn't paint, he couldn't draw, because those were the kinds of words that he heard constantly. And he decided, all right, I'll take matters into my own hands. Here's my model, and this is what I have to say. And here, of course, this is the potato eaters from those years, 1885. We look at this piece and we think it's very naive. 
but it's a, it's a strong, strong narrative. And it gives us a very fluent, if you will, story about this family, about life, about the intensity of survival. We see the lamplight, and it forms a, re a kind of chiaroscuro for us, that spotlit effect when the edges of a painting are dark, and it's, and it's like it's almost on stage uh, in the middle. And here, if you will look at the individual that is the second from the left, from our left, it's hard to imagine that someone who paints like that, in fact, created over 100 studies of that face. That is obsession.